Good afternoon and welcome to this session being hosted by Integrated Mountain Initiatives, IMI. This session is being streamed online via Facebook as well as YouTube. You. Two days ago, uh, you must have seen in one of the newspapers the beautiful picture of Gangotri mountain range seen from Shaharanpur, 200 kilometers away, which has happened after many decades. And I'm sure all of you have seen similar visuals where nature has been at play, but we don't know really how long it will last. And will we learn from this that humans are at the end responsible and have to do something about the changes happening around us and to us. COVID-19 has turned the whole world inside out or let me say outside in or upside down, whichever way you look at it. The world is not going to be the same again. And therefore, this is a moment that blip in time which has the seeds of a future which we would all like to see for our children. So can we grab that opportunity, that moment in time? We have all seen challenges and livelihoods happening, especially in the mountain regions, particularly rural livelihoods, but they get compounded much more by the looming challenges of climate change which all of us are aware about, but unfortunately not much is happening anywhere around the world. So in this context, IMI as a civil society volunteer driven organization has been working in the Indian Himalayan region, which is about 11 mountain states and two union territories to bring all the stakeholders together on one platform to focus on the complex issues which, as we have seen in COVID-19, do not respect boundaries. So the Himalayan region, which constitutes eight countries, has many common issues. The issues like impact of climate change on livelihoods, disasters, sustainable cities, and related issues such as water and many others. Therefore, the solutions have to be found quickly by engaging everyone, which IMI has been trying to do. It has been well researched by now that even with the best of efforts of arresting temperature increase due to climate change, if we can reach 1.5 degrees in the rest of the world by the end of 21st century, the increase would still be 2.1 degrees in the Himalayan region. So it is, can lead to disastrous impact on water and therefore livelihood amongst others. So this is the context in which we have to act and we have to act quickly. And that's why we are all here in this session. To take this forward, it's my pleasure now to introduce Mr. P.D. Rai as the moderator of this webinar. And let me say that with the best of education our country has to offer, he worked as a banker, as an entrepreneur, as a government leader, as an environmentalist, and as a politician. Amongst many distinguished responsibilities, he was the managing director of the Sikkim Milk Union, Vice Chair of the Planning Commission of Sikkim, Founding Chair of the Ecotourism and Conservation Society of Sikkim, and a two-time Lok Sabha Member of Parliament. Among many other achievements of his as a member of Lok Sabha, um, a few years ago, he mooted the private member's bill to recategorize bamboo as from a forest produce to an agriculture produce as a grass. And as all of us can see, it has huge implications on the changed livelihoods in the mountain regions. And that 
mem bill was finally passed by the parliament a couple of years ago we are privileged therefore to have mr rai amongst us and equally privileged to have him as a founding member of imi and a councillor of imi so with these words i would like to hand over the proceedings to mr p d rai thank you PD, you're on mute. Hey, Mike. Thank you, uh, Sushil ji. That was I said is is just a little too long as an int introduction. Anyway, thank you uh, all the same. And now to take it forward, may I request uh, Priya to present the findings from the ground? I mean, as in we just uh, did a, a very quick survey. <clears throat> but we received a very uh, over 400 response uh, responses from 400 people from across the mountain states and she will present that uh, priya who is uh, with the uh, wwf and leads the team in sikkim uh, will now take over priya thank you sir good evening everyone so i will just quickly run you through a very rapid survey that we did as preparation for this webinar and this was done within a span of uh, two three days so basically we were trying to look at covid-19 impacts and the responses so if i could go to the first slide amrita we had a total uh, the total respondents were 422 and basically most of the respondents are from sikkim west bengal uh, uttarakhand uh, mizoram and arunachal pradesh as well as uh, a couple of other northeastern states put together and if you look at uh, uh, the male female we have mostly male 61% who responded and female uh, at 38 okay. and uh, we've also had uh, about 40% uh, urban respondents and rural is about 60% respondents so the first question that we were trying to look at was what were the sectors that were most impacted due to the lockdown and uh, no surprises here i think most of us already know and these were basically just proven by uh, the people who have responded is that uh, tourism the daily wage industry uh, the education these have been the most impacted uh, sector due to the lockdown and when we look at this graph basically we are looking at the very high and high rankings that people uh, gave to this sector so those are the two main rankings that we were looking at when we presented the uh, prepared this graph then we also went down into asking into more details about the fam at the family level what were the most serious impact of lockdown and then uh, if you can go back uh, amrita to the uh, family slide yes so there were a number of things uh, that the respondents have sort of uh, ticked upon and so but then if you look at it across rural and urban the responses are very similar as for uh, you know worry about uh, children's education office work access to health uh, you know social and religious uh, interruptions cash income if you look at it uh, the, the uh, there is a slight edge for the rural respondents uh, on the cash income side and uh, so uh, as well as also on food availability and loan and credit repayments uh, the rural has a slight edge over the urban respondents so if we move to the next thing of looking at we also looked at who was the most who felt most bored and this was like an interesting insight to come out with that uh, it was mostly the female urbans who responded uh, 26% of them said that uh, uh, you know they felt most bored so uh, so if we move to the next slide uh, uh, so we were also trying to look at what were the negative impacts that uh, the, the, uh, that were observed, and these are also I think things we already know about. Uh, but just to put it out there again, uh, the rural and the urban. If you look, uh, it's uh, similar, <coughs> except for the increased stigma. Actually, if you look, it is more uh, you know the at the urban uh, at the urban level, and then the other things about crop livestock depredation if you see that's also an interesting insight that the urban respondents 
also have actually responded on crop and livestock depredation. Uh, and then other social issues of domestic violence, drugs and substance abuse, these have also been sort of uh, across rural urban, we see some similarity. We can move to the next slide, which talks about the positive impacts. And uh, so here, I think most of us have already seen these. And uh, uh, so you can see that more urban uh, uh, respondents are talking about less pollution, talking about making time with family. Again, these are things that just we needed numbers to uh, figure out. Otherwise, these are things which we are already experiencing. So if we can move to the next slide. Uh, to where we then try to uh, put a question on what, what sectors need to be focused on for the future. And these are the four major sectors uh, that people have responded on uh, with very high, high and medium ranking is the agriculture, the market linkage uh, for uh, produce, village produce, health services, education and labor requirement. These are the top sectors that people have responded upon uh, from across the uh, mountain states that have responded. And then if we go to looking at slight more details of, about what are the main future concerns that people have, we sort of try to categorize them into uh, different uh, groups. And if we look at the top five, the first thing that people are responding on is job security followed by uh, health, self-reliance, self-sufficiency, economy, and education. These are the top five sectors that people have responded. There is definitely like some divide between the rural and the urban when they look at these uh, figures, uh, but these are the top five sectors. And then uh, after that, somehow, uh, you know, with similar sort of effort, uh, sorry, please go back. Uh, is uh, you know people are talking about food security agri market linkage the environment and then also i think a new emerging thing that has come about is looking at social norms and how we would now follow those in the future how that would change for us in the future these are also uh, uh, concerns that people have at the back of their minds and then uh, uh, at the end there are also a number of other things that people have responded on, looking at issues of stigma. Uh, if you see, tourism actually finds very little uh, uh, focus and very few people responded on tourism being a concern or like a, a, a future focus. And then uh, if you look at some of the uh, you know new emerging things that are coming up, uh, we've just placed those uh, at the bottom, like facing the new normal, more local, less global, ideas, ideas of solidarity, sustainability, and then also this emerging thing about having a roadmap for a new paradigm. So basically these are uh, some of the, you know, these are findings from the very rapid survey that was conducted. And uh, also probably if it was not uh, undertaken in these times, the responses would have been totally different. But these are the responses for now in the changing scenario. Uh, yeah, so the last slide basically just uh, uh, talks about the team who has conducted this, uh, who had made this effort possible. So I'll just leave it there and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Priya. But it's, it's very uh, clear that uh, the findings um, resonate with why we are uh, here today to discuss this particular issue. But first, let me start by welcoming all the participants today we have almost 187 people who have uh, registered uh, there are more registrations but people who have joined us but thank you for being taking time out thank you to the uh, uh, panelists who i will introduce later but we are discussing the future of livelihoods in the mountain areas under the twin dark clouds of the pandemic and climate change the key takeaways will be one addressing issues of lives and livelihoods in the mountain areas. And two, building some strategies to rebuild more resilient mountain communities in this particular era. As has already been stated by my friend uh, Sushil Ramolaji, the world over we are grappling with the downturn in economies. This has forced almost 1.6 million workers out of jobs. These are mainly daily wage and mostly in the informal sector. Many of these migrants have also uh, been impacted in our country 
uh, which all of us have been following with a sense of foreboding and anxiety. Their fate and the fate of our brothers and sisters in the mountains are the same. More so because the vulnerabilities that are there uh, in the mountain areas due to the mountain specificities is tremendous. We are in many ways lucky that due to poorer trade intercourse with the rest of the country, we have not imported cases in abundance. Today, the figures speak for themselves. We have a total of 177 cases in the mountain states of India compared to over 35,000 countrywide. That is just half a percent. But the impact on livelihoods is immense, from farmers not being able to sell their produce to loss of jobs, mainly in the manufacturing and the tourism sectors. As per the EC Mode report, the Hindu Kush Himalaya assessment on mountains, climate change, sustainability, and people, the livelihoods in the mountains are hugely problematic due to several transitions, such as out migrations from the mountain areas and loss of traditional jobs and occupation. Furthermore, the vulnerabilities are compounded due to poverty and other issues captured in the multi-dimensional index of poverty. Climate change was already stalking the mountain states with disproportionate rise in temperatures and melting of glaciers. The havoc caused by unseasonal rains and landslides, besides other disasters, is increasing the plight of the people in the mountains. Other issues relate to man-animal conflicts and increasing problems of waste and its management. Now we have this pandemic. Even though we are currently not quite impacted, the threat of it happening in the coming months is real. We know that till there is a cure, a vaccine, it is impossible to live life as usual. The lockdown has shown how vulnerable our economy is to a pandemic, and so some reassessment will happen in the minds of the people, as has already been pointed out in the survey. And they will also reassess their risks. To discuss these and other issues and to link up the double whammy, we have some of the best minds amongst us. I would like to welcome them. Mr. Vijay Mahajan, Dr. Navroz Dubash, Professor J. Srinivasan, and Mrs. Benita Shah. They will be taking questions from me and answering, and then later on, it will also be open to the, uh, uh, to the audience. I would like to welcome them. I'm confident that at the end of this session, we will be able to understand the nuances of the challenges and find ways to address the same and look at the livelihoods uh, through a lot of reimagination. And so without further ado, may I introduce Mr. Vijay Mahajan. His name says it all. He is a Mahajan amongst us who has spent his entire life looking at all aspects of livelihoods. His brief CV has been put up, so you may read it. But my opening question to Vijay. Vijay, like I have said, we have a virus that sometimes, that somehow has stripped the globalization story and the economies built around it. We are in a phase wherein it will be impossible to start all the businesses because of the lockdown and fear of infection. Furthermore, the mainstay of mountain states has been largely tourism and services. Today, thousands have lost their jobs and livelihoods. Where do we go from here? You have five minutes. Vijay. Yeah. So, um, first of all, this survey was very uh, sort of enlightening, and I'm actually happy that almost no one seems to have mentioned tourism or rather it's dropping off as an important concern, although they have talked about uh, you know, reduction in income or the economy in general. So in that sense, it's indirectly covered. <clears throat> but the greater concern was on things like agriculture, health, and education, which is wonderful. Uh, so I think we should take it as given that the global economy and the Indian economy and therefore the mountain economy, all three definitely going to, are going to have a significant downturn for the next two quarters. And after that, 
there will be some turnaround uh, i hope and uh, you know depending on what measures the government and the banks take uh, the turnaround could be as fast as a year which is called the v shape or could take two years which is called u shape there are some doomsday scenarios about <clears throat> l shaped and so on but i don't think we'll get there there's you know despite all that has happened the system has shown and the people have shown great amount of resilience uh, so <clears throat> so let's focus on the revival phase uh, and i am assuming that uh, there was already a significant amount of youth unemployment in the mountain states and that has got exacerbated by many people who used to migrate uh, at least for a few months a year having come back and it's also got exacerbated by a drop off of the tourist season particularly in this summer so the short run i think will have to be only handled through uh, you know programs like uh, uh, cash transfers and uh, uh, you know pds rations for the extremely poor and uh, uh, you know maybe uh, mnre ga type of works for those who can work and earn and for people who are running businesses uh, uh, some degree of uh, you know restarting credit from the banks uh, it's not enough to simply say that three, there's a moratorium of two or three months on repaying the fact is that Uh, if the downturn is going to last for six months, uh, either the moratorium will have to be longer, or there may be a requirement for some recapitalization. But the bigger issue, which is one of uh, long-term structural unemployment, youth and unemployment in the hill areas, uh, that always remained, and it's got exacerbated. So three years ago, for the IMI conference in Itanagar, I had written a paper saying GDP for the mountains should mean green and digital prosperity, and I still stand by that. And <clears throat> uh, green, of course, certainly means agriculture, animal husbandry, forestry, uh, and but I also include in it renewable energy. I include in it uh, natural resources like water. Uh, and so on so uh, so all green activities which can be performed uh, a locally and b which in fact go towards uh, mitigating some of the adverse effects of climate change uh, are i think worthy of serious uh, investments by these uh, respective state governments and the central government so uh, for example uh, treatment of the upper watersheds uh, for water conservation uh, reviving the the uh, hill streams and rivulets uh, uh, you know taking care of the degraded forests uh, regreening them uh, the hill slopes uh, particularly where roads were got built which were got uh, recently eroded uh, you know that itself can generate not just a large amount of short term employment uh, but also regenerate the uh, the environment and the natural resources which will have a long term positive effect Thank and you. certainly the <clears throat> the money that the 15 finance commission uh, is had agreed to give additionally to mountain states for providing ecological benefits to the rest of the country uh that should clearly be earmarked for this and not for there should be a ban on even 1 rupee of that being used for anything other than for restoring the environment uh, it should not be used for building uh, roads or guest houses or yeah. uh, you know any anything else it should be only used for the environment in addition the state government should uh, use the manrega money significantly for natural resource uh, regeneration rather than Things like road building. Okay. So this is, uh, if you want to remember it as a easy to remember acronym, I call it uh, W E L L. So W is for water resources, E is for uh, 
energy, renewable energy, both solar photovoltaic, but also micro hydro and so on. L is for land, which includes both agricultural land as well as forest land. And the second L is for livestock. Now, the other half of GDP, as I said, green and digital. Now, mountains always had this problem that they felt they were remote. Uh, but now, actually, because of COVID, uh, even if you are sitting, as I am right now, in the heart of Delhi, you are effectively remote. We are all working. This webinar is happening remotely. So remoteness is no longer uh, <clears throat> a severe problem only for the mountains. And as a result, the new technologies, new methodologies, new working styles that have come up should benefit the mountain states. <clears throat> And therefore, the other half of my prescription is D-O-N-E. So it becomes well done. D stands for digital. So every young person in the hills should be 120% digitally literate. They should know how to use smartphones. They should know how to download apps. They should know how to, of course, <clears throat> upload things, how, how to do financial transactions, how to you know, upload their, uh, if they're making some handicraft items, how to receive orders, how to book orders, uh, you know, all of that. Uh, <clears throat> this also how to get government benefits. All of this should be, able, they should be enabled to do digitally. And we should do this in the next two, three months. Yeah, thanks. Sir. Always for organizing. So it's hard to do any economic activities by yourself. So like we have a large number of women's self-help groups uh, that's one form of organization they can be youth groups they can be producer organizations depending on what local items are being produced around the local products uh, it can be cooperatives it can be producer companies uh, all of these are different ways of organizing n is for non-farm activities so i've already covered land and livelihood uh, life, uh, livestock. So non-farm activities include things like handicrafts, uh, small uh, uh, manufacturing and repair services, all of that, uh, particularly on the roadside uh, in the hills, those are important activities. And I think they need to get a fillip. And for that, credit is very important. I'll come to that at, right at the end. But the last E is e-commerce. So in my well-done formula, E stands for e-commerce, and which is to take into account that while you can do a lot of uh, from remote areas, ultimately if you have some products, whether it is organic produce or whether it is handicraft items, you have to physically uh, transfer them uh, to the end user. <clears throat> and so some good logistics networks would have to be built to support e-commerce. But if that is done, then I think between uh, all the way starting from water and ending with e-commerce, we have a comprehensive solution for addressing uh, employment opportunities, which actually arise due to the twin uh, shadows that you mentioned. Now, the Thank problem you. of how these will be financed is an important one. And uh, Mr. Rai, I would suggest that you give me a second chance later. Yeah, yeah. In that, like, we're coming to that. Yeah, we're coming to that. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, thank you uh, for uh, a detail well done. And uh, you know, making it into an acronym definitely helps. My uh, second uh, uh, panelist is uh, Professor Jay Srinivasan, who is a celebrated climate scientist who established the Divecha Center at the Indian Institute of Science, uh, Bangalore, and also has been an ed editor and contributor to the IPCC reports on climate change. I think his brief bio is up and keep it there for some time so that people can quickly read it. Uh, Professor Srinivasan, you've heard uh, uh, JG on how we can build from water right across to e-commerce. Uh, but uh, because you are a scientist and how do you see climate change enhancing uh, the risks of pandemics, which might actually further disrupt uh, the uh, these uh, uh, the the kind of uh, problems that uh, happen and gets further compounded. So, also, do you see that uh, we do find viruses jumping from animals and bats to man 
do you think that we are increasingly impacting habitats and making climate change much more real uh, uh, as pandemics? So can you, uh, you know, one impacts quickly like pandemics and one is a slow killer. You know, it's in five minutes, but I think just like uh, Vijay, you can take 10 minutes, but we'll have to cut it from uh, the next question. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bidia. <clears throat> First, I want to use the opportunity to tell <coughs> our leaders that this pandemic now is looking very bad only because almost all over the world, people did not pay any heed to the warning. Five years back, Bill Gates warned all of us about this pandemic. Later, former President Barack Obama warned uh, America. And uh, then in 2017, Time Magazine had a front page on the pandemic and how the world is not prepared. And last September, the World Bank and WHO warned of the imminent appearance of a pandemic. Now, all these were completely uh, ignored or forgotten by leaders. Same thing is happening as regards climate change. More than 30 years ago, uh, Jim, James Hansen from uh, NASA Goddard warned the US Senate that global warming is a major threat. In spite of that warning 30 years ago, even today, the leaders are not taking it seriously. I hope this pandemic acts as a trigger to convince our leaders that you have to deal with this problem right from today. If you wait for the changes to occur and then try to act, you will pay. Okay? So whenever you get an opportunity, we have to tell policymakers to see what happened in the case of the pandemic, same thing happened with climate change. And the second part is why early action is important. We can compare South Korea and U United States. South Korea learned its lesson from the past epidemic and was ready when this epidemic started in China. So both, both South Korea and America had their first uh, COVID death in January uh, 21st. Now, in the next two months, in America, the number of cases has gone above 1 million, while South Korea is in thousands. So this is a lesson for all of our leaders that act early, rely on a scientist and their prediction, act early because you act late, you're going to have a serious problem. Now, the other point to remember is, although the virus threat is right now in front of us and it's very uh, serious, it is a threat for a few months. I'm sure that with all the policy of social distancing and later on finding drugs and vaccines, we'll overcome this uh, difficulty and by next year, we'll be back to normal. In the case of global warming, it's not a threat as rapidly evolving as uh, the virus, but a threat to human existence is much more serious. So this must be clearly pointed out that we need to act early on climate change because once it starts happening, you cannot stop it. And there is no vaccine to stop climate change. There is a vaccine to stop the virus. I'm sure we'll find it in the next six months or one year. But for climate change, there's no vaccine. The only vaccine is you have to change your way of doing things. So that has to be uh, clearly pointed out to everyone. And the other point, remember, is the matter of uh, being uh, alert to the fact that climate change and virus will interact. One very nice example is the Saiga antelope. About 200,000 of these died in 2015 in Kazakhstan. Okay? And when they analyzed it, they found that the bacteria which are normally there in the animal and did not affect it, suddenly became virulent because of high temperature and humidity. So this shows the interaction between climate change and virus. And so we all have to alert that because of warming, viruses can become more virulent. Now, the other thing is, of course, for mountain regions, glaciers are retreating. As glaciers retreat, as the ice melts, people have shown, especially a recent paper about Tibetan glaciers, when the glaciers retreat, they found ancient viruses 
which were frozen for 10,000 years, they start emerging. And uh, these are viruses we not see. So this must be kept in mind that viruses coming out of melting glaciers may also pose a serious threat to mountain community as well as the whole world. And the best way to understand how we deal with this is to, is to understand that if you're well prepared, then your impact is less. And the best example is of a natural thing like earthquake. For example, in 2010, two earthquakes occurred, one in New Zealand and other in uh, Haiti, both around seven in the Richter scale. In New Zealand, there were no casualties, no deaths. In Haiti, there were 100,000 uh, deaths. This shows clearly that in dealing with viruses or climate change, being prepared is very important. Okay, and uh, we have seen, of course, the impact of the shutdown on the air pollution, showing very well that the warning given for a long time by climate scientists uh, that air pollution was mainly by our transport sector has gone uh, to be true. And uh, so we have to keep this in mind so that we make the transition to renewable energy as quickly as possible so that we can enjoy the benefits of clean air. And the other issue, of course, relevant to modern communities is the uh, uh, glacial lake outbreak flood. One of them occurred in Kedarnath seven years ago. And I know Sikkim is uh, well prepared in some of these, but not all modern communities are managing this well. And it's important that uh, this be pointed out that due to global warming, these threats are going to increase in the next uh, 20 years. And I also hope this is a good opportunity to promote electric vehicles in the uh, modern community because not only it's called less pollution and it will also make the experience for uh, tourists much better. And uh, finally, I just want to point out three lessons from this uh, pandemic. One, do not ignore the warning given by scientists. We cannot go on uh, polluting air, water, and ocean and hope that the Earth is somehow able to adjust. And you have to transition to a new sustainable way of living. And so this is the right occasion now that the warning has come through a virus to alert everyone that they have to change the way we live. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor. You are the scientist amongst us. And uh, uh, I think the point that you have made, which is you have to believe scientists, I think is uh, uh, well thought through. Uh, and it's well received. So now we uh, can we turn to uh, Mrs. Benita Shah, uh, who is a, li a lifelong grassroots worker and is seriously in the business of livelihoods in the mountains. Uh, can we put up uh, uh, Madam Benita Shah's uh, profile, please? Yeah. Now, uh, Benita, the, the point uh, I think uh, which has I mean, you can build on the point which already uh, Vijay has uh, talked about. We're talking about livelihoods in the mountains and how do we address it? We also know that scientists have predicted uh, much more problematics that will come in the, in the future. And the point that is being made by the professor is that being well prepared, uh, there is nothing like being well prepared for this. But it, if we are to build resilience, which we'll come to later, uh, then there are many other steps that we need to take. So in your view, what would be the changing, uh, as you have seen, the changing concerns, and how is that going to impact uh, the mountain people? You have five minutes, but you can take 10 minutes. Okay. And then we'll... Yeah, good, evening, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm not going to waste much time and go straight to the point. Yeah, I'm going to carry uh, ahead from where Mr. Mahajan left. Uh, livelihoods in Uttarakhand is a chronic issue. Ever since we, became, we attained statehood in November 2000 until now, uh, it is the priority number one issue discussed at all forums, whether it's development, state government or government of India. Now, with the present problem of COVID, it becomes further more. In a way, it is escalated. It is... Uh, slightly more complex. You have uh, uh, unemployment. In 1920, the data said that the unemployment presently in the state is probably the highest.
highest ever it was in the last four decades. Now, this is something really surprising. And this is what uh, the uh, Human Resource uh, Ministry has said this. If you look at the agriculture sector per se, is basically what my sector is, agriculture, which includes horticulture and live, live, livestock and water, I mean, forest-based livelihood, etc. We find that we have lost close to 25,000 arable land in the last 1,000 hect hectares of arable land in the mountain areas, of which 7,000 hectares is basically degraded. Now, all this has happened in the last 10, 15 years. Now, this is anyway the, the problem which is staring at us straightforward. And now you have this new issue that we have to now readjust the, the reverse migration people who have come back or those guys who are already sitting there unemployed. How can they be further deployed into the kind of agriculture sector that, that we have? So it, it's a problem, super problem kind of a situation. So... And then to top it all, we have Palayan Ayog, which came out with this, you know, alarm bell that look, we have 600 ghost villages in, in, in our state. And which is not, nothing which is, uh, not, you know, a surprise. We can see it if you drive from Kodi or you drive to Almora, you can see these thousands and hundreds of hectares lying abandoned homes which are locked, etc. So we, we know this problem very well. A few things which have happened, which you can say the positives which have happened in the last two years, as current as that is. A gazette notification <clears throat> by government of India declaring millets. Jinko hum Hindi mein, we used to call them the Mota Anaj. So it was the neglected grain. Suddenly has got now an exalted status of neutra cereals. Now this gazette this notification happened in 2000. You know, uh, uh, gaiety and, and celebrate, celebration all over the country, not just in Uttarakhand. In, in Uttarakhand, particularly, what happened in the mountains uh, uh, districts? Out of the seven lakh hectares that we have, total of the arable or the farm area in the state, five lakhs of, of this area is in the mountains, so the ten mountain districts. Now, of these ten mountain districts, eighty percent, close to eighty percent, is under millet production. Now, suddenly, if millets are now the new health the Nutras cereals and the MSP which has the, which the government of India has declared which is more important is suddenly very attractive that makes good sense taking a cue from that in 2019 itself and since I'm also working with the Uttarakhand um, uh, marketing board that is the Mandi Parishad uh, the government decided to bring out a small revolving fund and close to 600 tons of millet was produced directly by the farmers at the MSP at the at a, at a state MSP rate. So this uh, has changed the equation of small farmers in a single act. And I'll explain how from finger millet, the returns which were originally 24,000 rupees per hectare has now suddenly become 45,000 rupees a hectare, finger millet, madwa. Amaranth, which was already a cash crop, but what kind of a cash crop it was? It was more like a barter crop. There were these wholesalers who would go and go to every household up in the mountains, start collecting the amaranth, but not pay them in cash. It was always a barter system. The farmer would feel, oh, he got 24 rupees or he got 30 rupees per, per kg, but actually he got in return a few kgs of rice, uh, uh, salt and wheat. And that could be sort of justified into a value of 24 or 25. But now with the MSP and the Mandi buying directly from the farmers, the rate was these 52 of one kg of amaranth. Now that has spiked up the returns from per hectare, per hectare for amaranth from 60,000 rupees a hectare. And that also is a caveat for 60,000, not in rupees, in kind to a cash transaction of 82,000 rupees 500 per hectare. So this is very interesting. So we have made these records and we have in fact post this purchase and post all the money which was you know, put into the DBT as a DBT into the farmer's accounts. There has been a great amount of uh, interest among small farmers to suddenly look at millets as a new thing to do now for the mountains. Now it's context with climate change is very interesting. Now millets are also the C4 crops. C4 crops mean these are millets, not just the mountain millets, all millets. It's also your bajra, your jawar, all of these. These are certain crops which absorb carbon dioxide. So they are climate happy, climate smart crops. 
Now, this is very late till the so we have been you know hogging ourselves only with rice and wheat and rice and wheat potato sugarcane etc but it's the millets which are actually the climate smart crops now this makes a perfect case for the mountains to go further in this direction now what happens to all the grain or all the the millet that has been purchased at a good rate now if you look at the present situation that is the covid uh, aspect or the pandemic which may continue it may reoccur can we keep our youth back into their villages how do we give them employment so a few days ago we were discussing within our own uh, sdf uh, platform and we were talking about something known as the local economy generation or the circular economy now if we can use this local produce have a value a value addition and plow it back into our pds systems not just pds systems back into the private sector and the micro enterprise in the form of bakeries in the form of small food essentials and so on and so forth so this is one way of a, a kind of a large chunk of where even the land resource is used the local material is used and the value addition a small uh, i would say uh, bits of policy intervention the support of it and the other stakeholders i think small chippings can has to happen i'm only going to talk about the last two points in this whole thing uttarakhand has anyway taken the organic agriculture policy in 2011 i was a part of it but in the last 2 3 years again there has been an interest shown now by government of india now this is very interesting but ever since this pandemic happened our organic consumers suddenly there was a two to three times increase of organic and health based nutraceuticals and food items among the consumers i think all of us every, in fact there was a, a, a media you know interview which also happened they wanted to ask people does organic food bring you more immune immunity and to fight against covid now even these are the kind of thoughts which consumers are happening yes i think mountains and specific states organic states like sikkim uttarakhand himachal to some extent do have this edge if you produce something there's a higher value when you already have markets within the state as well as outside the state so this is how we have to we can see also would like to bring to, to your information there was mr shrinivas organic it has already been shown uh, on research at at an international level in fact fao did this study with fibel which is based in switzerland the leading scientific organization in organic agriculture that organic agriculture is one of the largest carbon sequestering uh, system it, it can actually sequester up to 10 tons of carbon per year per hectare Well, this is a very very interesting data i don't know why we are not taking it seriously we can actually bring change in our micro climates we can bring in definitely change in micro climate by by just doing these in small you know in small watersheds or in small areas so i think this is something where we where we stand on the challenge however big is how do you get all these various uh, you know uh, 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 activities together and here what i i will echo what mr mahajan said it is where to get the capital in we have to bring in the voluntary sector i think to to participate it's high time that the voluntary sector has to now participate in a in a much larger way than it did before not for social i would say uh, uh, empowerment not for economic empowerment but to create economic models where you generate employment and also produce goods our gdp for agriculture presently is the most dismal low it is 0.89 yes, yes. so Thank this you, is something but all these things can be uh, we can work on this and this is i think i can continue we are really later. running out of time actually uh, uh, so uh, thank you vinita the very interesting points uh, that you have brought and now uh, i'd like to bring in dr uh, dubash uh, you know dr dubash is uh, is a very key thinker in the world of climate change and policy and his brief bio is already up uh, and you can look at it but dr dubash now you know you've heard the uh, set of uh, arguments that have been made for the livelihoods and building the resilience and you you've seen some interesting highlights as to how organic agriculture also sequesters more carbon uh, in your view how do you think that you know uh, we can use the current kind of uh, situation to trigger a much larger uh, much larger uh, uh, you know activity 
which will help climate at, at the same time also livelihoods in this particular era. Dr. Dubai. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rai and uh, Mr. Ravola and other organizers. Um, I've learned a lot from the panelists that preceded me. Let me just try and make a few points and then I'm sure we all are keen to get uh, all the audience in and, and discuss a little bit more. Um, so uh, perhaps it goes without saying that uh, many of us see the sort of big shifts that have been brought about by COVID and wonder whether there's scope for some, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, having larger conversations that are often muted uh, given the day-to-day -day sort of pressures that we always uh, face. Uh, at the same time, uh, there's definitely a moment where the short-term emphasis, in particular dealing with, with, uh, with livelihood losses, uh, uh, migrants uh, across the country, these are the things that are going to consume us. And so there's really a risk that all the kinds of things we care about with climate change and other things, air pollution will get crowded out. Uh, and it's up to us then to find sort of a clever way of linking these things so that they don't get crowded out. I think that's, that's we have to find, chart a middle course uh, between treating this unabashedly as an opportunity and having it be crowded out. So there's three or four trends. Uh, I might repeat a little bit of what the other uh, panelists have said, but I just want to flag them. So what are some of the trends that we know are going to happen? and to which we don't have clear answers, particularly for the mountain states. I think it very, came out very clearly in the uh, presentation at the beginning that tourism is going to face a short to medium term downturn, and that is going to be an enormous shock to uh, the mountain states in particular. I don't know the context of the mountain states well enough, but that has to be the number one thing. The jobs that are directly dependent on tourism, I think, uh, are something that one will have to find some way of tiding over. Hopefully tourism will return. Uh, but that is uh, that is uh, an issue. Uh, the second is, uh, and I've seen on the chat, several people have brought up migrants uh, uh, and the broader sort of nature of India's uh, labor market, which is very heavily dependent on, 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 on migrants. And I think that the literature I'm reading suggests that we are moving to an era, both in terms of global supply chains, but even within countries of increasing emphasis placed on some degree of localization. Uh, so not so much so resilience being part of not being dependent on other regions quite as much. And again, it's a trend that I think we have to identify. I'm not sure quite uh, uh, what it means, but I think this is, this is sort of the second big shift that we will see. Now trying to get something more specific. Um, uh, three or four areas where specific things could happen in the context of this COVID crisis that are also salient to climate change. I think there is a real moment here for changes in behavior around, and I think uh, Mr. Mahajan already talked about this when he talked about digitalization, but changes in behavior when it comes to the, the willingness to engage remotely for all kinds of social and economic activities. That everybody's been forced into a natural experiment with this. Uh, and as Mr. Mahajan said, the distance that the mountain states face from centers of economic activity and other places could be bridged more effectively given that there will be greater willingness uh, uh, to, uh, to engage in, in virtual uh, interaction. Uh, the second, I was very, very interested in, in Vineta Ji's comments uh, about, about the uh, millets and the MSPs for millets and so on. Uh, there is a real moment here to shake free some of the taken for granted ways in which we do agriculture in this country. I've been reading recently that in Punjab and Haryana, uh, farmers faced with labor shortage are thinking of planting maize and corn. So you might break the, 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 the uh, rice wheat uh, cycle in Punjab and Haryana, which is tied to the, the, the residue burning and air pollution and so on and so forth. So finding ways, and it might well be the millet story that, that we were talking about, finding ways to rethink uh, agricultural systems. Now when there is a moment and to do that and back it up by government policies, such as shifting the uh, regime of MSPs. I think a very deliberate push uh, that is context specific, that is uh, it's obviously the story in the mountain states is different from that in Punjab Haryana, but each location we can rethink uh, what this kind of lock-in that we've had for, for decades now uh, to certain uh, crop varieties. I think that's a huge opportunity. Uh, there are only so many things to say about this, so I risk repeating, but I, I, I want to also support the idea and something I was uh, planning to say about the fact that when uh, um, uh, uh, fiscal resources are made available to tide over this crisis, to deal with migrants and so on, 
very carefully targeting that money in a way that allows rural areas in hill states to be more climate resilient in the future. So the sorts of things that we talked about already as part of Sikkim's uh, climate action plan. I know there's this whole mountaintop water harvesting that's been discussed and things like this. So, so putting labor generating activities into climate resilience in a very thoughtful way uh, that caters to state by state, I think is the third action area. And the fourth that has been alluded to, but hasn't been mentioned that much, is on the energy system. The energy system, because of the down, uh, in particular electricity system, because of the downturn in demand, is definitely going through a crisis. Uh, in uh, in uh, Delhi and the, and the Indo-Gangetic Plain, that affords a possible opportunity to more rapidly phase out coal-fired power plants. In the hill states, it might afford an opportunity to rapidly sh to accelerate the shift towards renewable energy which is also locally controlled and allows for more uh, resilience to such shocks uh, in the future. So can we rethink the electricity system in particular and energy systems more generally uh, coming out of this uh, come out of this crisis? I'll just stop there, uh, Mr. Rai, because I think it'd be good to have some time for discussion, but these are just a few thoughts I, I thought I would share. I believe you're on mute. Thank you, doc Dr. Dibash. Uh, so now we'll, uh, you know, uh, because of the time uh, limitations that we have, uh, I was thinking that uh, we have three questions we can take from uh, the audience right now, uh, live, and then I'll hand it over to uh, my colleagues, um, Amba Jameer and uh, uh, Mr. Sushil Ramola to carry on, and then we'll return in the end. I promise Mr. Mahajan uh, some time, which I will give to him at the end. So, uh, can we have the first question uh, from Ms. Karma Bhutia? Yes, Karma. So, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everybody in the panel. Uh, my question is very, very, very to the, to the point about what's uh, generally happening uh, in terms of livelihood and especially Sikkim and the IHR region. One is we've gone through this uh, entire process, right? About uh, two months now. Uh, give or take, I mean, without uh, uh, work, people not having work. And this huge income shock that has come uh, to people that's really disrupting their lives. According to Outlook, also there are 100 odd million of people, uh, I mean, Indians are going to be out of job during this uh, lockdown process. So, and specifically for Sikkim and basically the Himalayan region with, where we are more, uh, I, I guess, in, in terms of tourism, hospitality, that's the industry, industry of focus. So, uh, and which is again, nothing that you can kind of like, you can't, you can't circumvent that because social distancing, etc. whatever the protocols are to fight uh, COVID are going against the entire, uh, the, the industry as it stands. So how, how do you see us to re restart or jumpstart that, that process of, uh, you know, bringing this in? So this could go to, uh, Mr. Majan and uh, Dr. Dubash, one of you can answer this. Especially, uh, very, very uh, concerned about the the tourism sector, the service sector that's in the hills, and and how we how we how we bring this forward, how we kick this uh, yeah. kick started. You know, this seems to be the major uh, concern, uh, especially in the mountain areas. Uh, who, uh, Mr. Majan? Well. Uh, as I said, in the short run, it's a difficult one to answer. But in the long run, my suggestion would be to go the way Bhutan always did. Uh, Bhutan does have, uh, does permit tourism, but basically through its visa methods, it ensures that you, it only gets high-end tourists with near 100% free booking of almost everything that has to be, you know, whether it's ground transportation or hotels and so forth. So through that process, you maintain uh, the revenue, but you all the other disruption that happens due to mass tourism, uh, you know, and Sikkim particularly gets a lot of mass tourism, uh, you know, coming up from West Bengal, uh, you know, that can, <clears throat> if there was a way to, to sift that. So my suggestion would be that if possible, the lower end hotels should all really be converted into, uh, you know, some other businesses and what those businesses are is is mainly will have to be either green that is processing of the kind of thing that Benita mentioned or 
they would have to be digital, uh, providing uh, you know services outside. So the, the, the built up accommodation can therefore always be easily converted. But I think to go back to mass tourism is not a good idea and just as well. Equally true for Uttarakhand, uh, you know, that Chardham uh, highway system that was being built was already quite disastrous for Uttarakhand. And so, so I, you know, as several other speakers have said, this is a moment in our history where we need to use the setback to actually reboot the system, but not back to business as usual, whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in tourism, or whether it is in other employment opportunities. I will stop there, but uh, Mr. Rai, the issue of capital is very important. So at some stage, we need to- We'll bring that in. We'll bring that in. Uh, Navroz, do you have a quick uh, comment on this one? Uh, no, I'm, I'm happy to let the discussion continue. You know, I think this is an intractable one. There's no short-term fix, uh, uh, but I think using it, the, the rebooting metaphor is a good one, and that's what should be discussed. Yeah. So uh, the second question is from Ishani Palandurkar. Ishani? Yes. Uh, my question is to uh, Dr. Dubash. And my question is, is it possible to identify most intensive sources of air pollution in the mountain states? And with the lifting of lockdown, can these emission sources be identified? And can the lockdown be used as an opportunity to introduce green livelihoods in the community? Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, you know, one of the problems with the air pollution debate is that we actually don't have data until very recently, even in the major cities, and we certainly don't have enough data in the, in the hill regions. So actually having the source apportionment studies to identify exactly what the sources are is, is a little uncertain. But if you can be reasonably clear that for the hill regions, much of the source is the generalized source coming from the Indo-Gangetic plain. So it will likely be the same sorts of things that we experience here in, uh, in Delhi, which is power plants, uh, transport emissions, uh, uh, brick kilns, industry, and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think for the hill regions, you know, it is, it is going to be, unfortunately, not something that is directly under your control. Uh, we have to solve the broader problem in the Indo-Gangetic plain uh, to benefit the hill regions uh, uh, as well. So I think it's, it's a more of a systemic issue. I'll just make one point one, uh, that, that, that takes off from your observation. One of the dangers, of course, of this COVID business is that the things that are also very important, uh, so for example, you know, the deaths due to attributable to air pollution are also extremely high according to the Lancet studies and other studies. We can't afford to put all those things entirely on the back burner uh, in the short run. And there has to be a case made that not all resources and not all activities can be repurposed entirely uh, uh, for this COVID crisis. Otherwise, we will end up uh, creating a bigger problem down the road. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's very good. Uh, Akshit, third and last question. Akshit, before I turn it over to Sushil Ramolaji and Amba. Akshit, not around? Akshit, not around? Okay, then uh, thank you, panelists. I will come back uh, at the end to uh, Mr. Vijay Marjan regarding the uh, capital. Uh, Akshit is there. Akshit? Hello? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you listen to me? Your question and to whom? Quick, make it very sharp. I think we'll have to let that drop. Uh, Sushil ji, can you take over from here? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rai. And uh, thank you, panelists, uh, for bringing in a very, very diverse perspective, combining these two very complex and interconnected issues. Uh, there are a number of questions uh, which uh, Amba and I will process. So I will start with the first question and then hand over to Amba to ask the next question. And wherever we have been, you know, we have tried to combine certain questions because they're, you know, which made sense. So my first question is um, coming from Puran Barthwal and it's about uh, reverse migration. And the 
question that has been raised is that many of the people who are going back not return and add to the already um, you know undisguised uh, un uh, disguised run climate which is happening in our rural areas and how do we create a system for them to learn the right skills i mean it does connect with what uh, mr mahajan had talked about of uh, you know well done strategy but how do we make it viable is the first question uh, that i would uh, like to ask him and um, how do we provide the in that uh, sense the funding for it so that question is addressed to mr mahajan Sushil, so this thanks. Uh, this also uh, gives me an opportunity to talk about the importance of mobilizing capital. So basically, in the short run, uh, as I said, the well part of well done largely requires public investments, and there are constraints on how much the government can spend. So that should happen over the medium run, but uh, uh, relief measures in Narega, but. The, the done part, the digital organizing and non-farm e-commerce is something that can be done at the level of individual or group micro enterprises. And there, my suggestion is uh, a, uh, you know, relying on funds gathered locally in the community. So uh, using the natural language meaning of the word mutual fund rather than the capital markets uh, mutual fund. So this is really mutual in the sense that people who all live in the same valley or the same sub-region, they, they pool their funds together and they help, uh, uh, you know, start off uh, or revive existing enterprises. Of course, there's no bar to receiving money from outside, but right now there's so much demand on capital uh, that it's going to be very, the yield will be very little for a lot of effort. The second is to get into linkages with external customers and get them to do uh, invoice financing or order financing. So whether it is for digital delivery or e-commerce delivery, uh, you know, uh, book orders with fairly short uh, returns uh, in terms of time, you know, 30 days uh, kind of, uh, you know, order return. And that can then start off the businesses. You'd be surprised that, you know, since the transaction margins in any running businesses typically are 15, 20%, you know, over six to nine months, a reasonable amount of working capital gets built. As far as fixed investments are concerned, they will have to be uh, minimized and uh, accommodation I don't think will be, buildings will not be a problem, particularly so many hotel rooms will all be uh, falling vacant so they can all be used for, uh, you know, workshop space or sitting space. We may require additional investments in computer hardware as well as in connectivity. Uh, we need to put together a fund for that. Uh, so I would suggest two funds, one at the local community levels and one a kind of a mountain venture fund, uh, which would be uh, available, uh, uh, you know, for a slightly higher level of enterprise. But basically, we need to start thinking in terms of how to finance uh, new businesses and revival of existing businesses. And also, uh, uh, you know, tra transferring tourism business, particularly lower end tourism business into other businesses. Uh, yes, uh, um, Amba. Uh, yes. Over to you. Thank, thanks, Sushil. Well, this question is um, for Dr. Lavrose, and I have put together a number of issues and tried to put it as one question, but maybe maybe there will be uh, two issues in this. Well, uh, the pandemic has, in many ways, brought about disruptive changes. And the Indian Himalayas are known to be rich in biodiversity. And of course, as rich as it may be in resources, it is poor in terms of development. Uh, the, the scenario is complex. And then given the vulnerability of climate change put together with that. So what could be 
the strategic trade-offs for the Himalayan states with regards to the development it requires. And on the other hand, uh, the question from another, um, two other people is, given that the Himalayan region has so much opportunities in terms of um, potential for hydroelectricity power, would a decentralized electricity or energy system really, really be uh, something to look into? That's, that's a question. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that. These are challenging, uh, challenging questions. Uh, the first question I understood to be really about the strategic trade-off between sort of uh, development uh, uh, and uh, uh, economic generating activities and the risk to uh, biodiversity and, and, uh, and vulnerable ecosystems. And I think there, you know, the it comes back to the earlier discussion in part about about tourism, which is one of the sort of potentially really high sort of uh, money spinners for the region, provided it can be made in the way that Vijay Mahajan described, uh, where it sustains over the long long term, and you don't have a form of mass tourism that undercuts uh, that undercuts the the uh, economic resource uh, itself. So I think that is that is really the the challenge as to how that how, whether how that can be done. Because obviously the mountain regions have to play to their strengths on this. I mean, their strengths are not going to be uh, in terms of uh, easy access for industrial capacity and so on and so forth. It's going to be around things like tourism. It's going to be around uh, maybe uh, very careful branding, such as Sikkim has done around organic farming uh, and, and so on. Um, it's, not a, it's not a very insightful answer, but I think that, that it, in a sense, we know what the trade-offs are. The challenge is actually in figuring out ways to, to, to get there. Um, on the hydroelectricity question, um, you know, we are in a strange situation in the power sector in India. We had a situation of surplus capacity, uh, but we are also in a situation where hydroelectricity is at a premium because it provides a possible balancing factor against fluctuating renewable energy uh, in the future. So we had this very interesting natural experiment during that Janta curfew business where nine minutes uh, of, of shutdown. Um, uh, sorry, not during the, during the nine minutes shutdown, rather the Janta curfew. And you had the national power system demand dip by almost a third in that nine minute window. And hydro was the big savior there, as well as some load shedding and so on. So hydro is going to be valuable. At the same time, in the long run, as battery storage technologies get cheaper, you may not need to rely on hydro uh, that much. So again, there's a trade-off there. How much do you invest in building hydro that may be valuable over the next five to 10 years, but may get uh, less and less valuable as other technologies come along versus uh, actually moving towards more decentralized electricity that's focused on meeting the needs of the hill system, uh, the hill uh, states without wondering, worrying too much about providing this buffer to the rest of the country. That's really the trade-off that has to be explored. Okay. Um, yeah. So I um, thank you. I, let me ask the next question. It's a very interesting question from Shivya Nath. Uh, it says that you know, twelve percent. I, I don't know the facts uh, right now, but it states that twelve percent of our country's carbon emissions come from livestock, uh, and it has impact on land and water. Uh, but yet we know that a largest growth in the rural areas can come from livestock so the potential use huge so here is a conundrum for us how do we create uh, a growth in this area while looking at the issues of environment so this is a very typical issue that we'll face where we are trying to balance our livelihood issues with the environmental change issues so this is open to any of the panelists uh, who wants to uh, take a shot at this uh, can I answer it, Srinivasan? Yes, please. Yeah, so I think the livestock issue is blown over. If you look at the total greenhouse gas emissions, livestock contribution is very small. And since India's per capita emission is already very small, we shouldn't worry about it at all. That should not be an issue for discussion at present. Yeah, I also wanted to say the same thing. Next. Um, Amba? Yes, uh, I, I have this for Vinita. 
and basically the question is the lockdown has brought about a number of uh, significant issues with regard to agriculture and we see that um, agricultural systems which are dependent on large supply chains are facing big problems whereas small farmers that contribute to the local economy are still continuing to be able to supply and do with what they are doing right now and this has brought about a state uh, or status where the so called primitive farmers who are not not as useless as they are for example from nagaland um it is such small farmers who are actually feeding the urban now in terms of uh, providing so many fresh vegetables and even wild and uncultivated food crops so what therefore should be the model now for agricultural systems and food production systems in terms of um, should we continue to follow the industrial supply chain models or what do you think should be the next step for mountain states to start thinking about Uh, yes, I think uh, uh, it is obvious. I don't think you have to say it in, in many words. Um, I will enumerate uh, an example. Uh, we in Dehradun, we we run organic hearts. Now there are three organic hearts which are presently running in Dehradun itself. There is one Sunday heart which is the oldest. Now there is a Thursday and there is a Wednesday heart which my organization uh, is running. Many of those. consumers in fact are probably here and in, in see the names popping up and it's very interesting because this uh, uh, fortunate this pandemic in fact on the on the hindsight gave this tremendous opportunity for not just our regular farmers who were anyway a part of the heart many new farmers who were earlier not being a part of it suddenly became a part of this uh, you know of this consumer forum and this is something known as the csa the consumer supported agriculture a very old model started of course in scotland many years ago it started because of organic agriculture but it has actually grown largely for small farmers and for local produce and local markets so it's a very interesting uh, phenomena that we could see now now most of our consumers and there are close to 400 consumers are being supplied fresh fruits and vegetables which are organic natural and even local there are even local vendors who have also joined the bank bank and they are so happy they are doing home deliveries we are running this hard of course not in 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 with the due uh, you know uh, procedures as prescribed by the by the by the district administration most of it are has converted into mini huts but the lessons drawn here is in fact just yesterday we were talking about is our hearts the only answer are they the future markets are the local markets the the ancient times in which the farmers used to move from place to place or rather you bring in a different model of where the local farmers are coming to sell their produce and like you like rightly said wild produce uh, very different kinds of vegetables and fruits which probably didn't have you know a market before suddenly has come into you know great existence and importance because of its nutritional uh, properties etc and i think this this whole model now with the digital you know um, uh, platforms so now it's a whatsapp group it's a it's an online sort of you know money transfer these platforms are for going to i think this is it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge uh, i think a jump and i think certainly uh, uh, the model to look forward to it may not be possible with cereals but i think to a great extent even cereals can be a part of it fruits and vegetables i think to a great extent is one of the uh, you know one of the ways to go forward and in fact industrial agriculture has has of course given us this great you know power that i can have a tomato from spain i can have uh, you know a chili from thailand but come on why can't why shouldn't i have my chili from salt why can't I have have my tomato from from haldwani you know or from uttarkashi If, if which is anyway there and uh, but it's just this sometimes i mean i i don't want to say this but it's a useless transport of of tomatoes and vegetables from a place to b place burning fuel doing unnecessarily production which is most of it is rotting it's just 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 unthinkable and this heart has made it literally like a very this pandemic has made these hearts look like a very nice you know beautiful story But yes i i firmly believe that uh, this is the answer and in in most of the organic uh, agriculture marketing models 
the best, most successful models have been hearts. Yeah. So let me um, uh, raise the next question. And I notice that it's good to have our friends from ISTI mode, Dr. Eklavya Sharma and Dr. Rajan Kotru uh, on the webinar. Uh, the common question which I've, I've taken out from their questions is that we are going to have more mouths to feed in the mountains, these large number of people. Therefore, we have to make resources available to them. And with today's uh, forest policies, rangeland policies, uh, you know, there is a limitation. We need to open out these policies. So there is a question about how do we change our policies so that we can make more resources available, not only the financial, but the resources to work on in the mountain regions. And secondly, the question is how do we take care of the productivity issues, the, you know, building the skills, capabilities of the people so that they can transform their ability to make use of those resources. So that this is a, a question I think I would uh, definitely um, ask uh, Vijay to respond to that as well as, uh, and even um, uh, Mr. Rai, you would like to address the policy issue. I think I'll let Mr. Rai handle it because I'll be repeating myself. Yeah. Uh, please continue. Please continue Vijay. Well, you know, see, uh, uh, Eklave, good to uh, see you at the webinar. Uh, you know, uh, water and sunshine are two highly abundant and wasted resources in the hills. Uh, so if we can actually ensure that every hand, uh, every human being that is there in, in the hills it becomes adept at uh, conserving both the water that falls and uh, you know uh, making good use of the sunshine that falls both through the photovoltaic as well as the photosynthetic route then i think the the economic gener uh, income generation is automatic and we also get an ecological payoff so the skilling effort that Sushil was referring to would have to be primarily on the on these two first. I'm a bit hesitant on opening up uh, access to rangelands and hill slopes and forests because you know we've we've had so much difficulty of of uh, maintaining uh, you know those those resources. And uh, additional population pressure could actually reverse the gains, the few gains that we have had in the last decade or so. So I would say let's focus on water and energy. And of course, that requires capital. And in this case, I think water would almost in all cases require public capital, whereas renewable energy could be managed through a small enterprise, a group enterprise mode. And that could be financed through banking and other uh, capital. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, uh, since uh, we are moving into the last five minutes, I'd like to, each of the uh, panelists to uh, just say in half a minute uh, the last, uh, most important thought. So, Navroz, uh, can you start it? Uh, yes, ha happy to. Um, there's, it's been a very rich discussion and there's a risk of, of uh, repeating things. But, the, but let me just say the, the most important thought that I have is, and it's something I'm grappling with, is how do we actually use this as a moment of opportunity? Um, uh, because it is a huge moment of opportunity to shift well-entrenched ways of thinking. Uh, I think we've had some very good examples, for example, in agricultural systems. Uh, and that requires not just getting people to, to see these opportunities, but shifting government and getting them to pay attention so that the policies reinforce some of the shifts that we want to see. Uh, and so building sort of sub-coalitions of people around three or four big shifts that we see as being possible, and then very strategically going after them, I think is the, is the need uh, that we face right now. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Jay Srinivasan? Yeah, I will just repeat and say that the most important thing is to 
be local and not depend on complex supply chains to get anything into the mountain. Uh, as already pointed out by others, you have inner resources and you manage it efficiently and locally. Thank you. Benita? Benita, you are on mute. Benita, you are on mute. Sorry, sir. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, I think, the time to uh, remember Gandhiji's example of, you know, Gram Swavlambhan. And we can rather look at that, what our former president, Kalam Saab, talked about, the Pura model. I think it's, uh, I mean, almost 100 years later. So, yes, we can re-engineer and have a new architecture of village, village cluster, district, and see what all can, you know, the interesting dynamics which can happen. And it's not just agriculture, it's not production, it is consumption. It also brings, you know, in its uh, purview, local medicine. I mean, I wanted to bring in uh, somebody's question about how you're going to deploy these migrants who have come, or the anyway unemployed people. We have got local medicine. I wanted to talk about medical care being the, one of the most important. Uh, you know, uh, it's going to create a mayhem. If there is a further lockdown, most 80% of people from the villages, from Uttarakhand mountains, come down for the medical treatment. Now, what is going to happen to them? So can we create paramedics? Like para-vets has been a very successful model in the veterinary side. Can we have paramedics? So again, I'm talking about the architecture of a local community expanded to a district. I think that's the way. Vijay? Yeah, so if there's one investment that really no. needs to be made immediately, it is uh, in upgrading the digital uh, infrastructure uh, because let's not forget that the survey identified uh, education as the biggest hit and so uh, if we want to make use of vast amounts of digital content that is now available a lot of it free then connectivity is the issue and so uh, whatever we can do to to you know just hook straight into the satellite signals from the mountains we should do that and convert our remoteness into an opportunity rather than into a constraint. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can, that, there is one question we have to take and that's from the person who we had uh, selected. I think his name is Akshit. Akshit, your question please. Sango, Sangomla. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hmm. Can you, can you, can you receive yes. it now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think my question has been addressed uh, by mostly by the panelists uh, as of now. Uh, but I just wanted to know what uh, specific concerns uh, does COVID-19, because of COVID-19 are rising because in the mountain states. What, are the, uh, what is specific uh, to the mountain states that we can't see anywhere else in, in the country? Anybody uh, from the panel? Vinita? I'm sorry, I thought, uh, what are the two main, uh, sorry, that we look at the mountains? Uh, no, no, I just wanted to know what what concerns uh, around the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown yeah. are specific to the mountain states, uh, which we can't see anywhere else. Yes, I think it has already been discussed. Uh, tourism, uh, you know, is the most important livelihood, uh, 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 you know, occupation or the livelihood for Uttarakhand uh, to the mountains today. And we know that with this pandemic, there we hardly can look at any tourism. I do not think this is summer. At this time, the next, at this time, there is no, you cannot put a foot in any of the uh, tourist places. And everyone is looking forward. The entire year depends on these 60, 70 days uh, of the season. Similar is the case with Garhwal, with the Chardham. So I think now what, 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 are we going to do? This is the single most livelihood, you know, around which so many people's lives hang. So I think we're just staring at, at, at something. Yeah. Like that. From the point of view of COVID, I think uh, what we are uh, really worried about is the moment we start opening up tourism, then uh, we will be inviting uh, the virus. And that is the thought which is, I think, are playing uppermost in the minds of all the 
the government uh, the governments around all the states and that's why lockdown seems to be uh, go- that seems to be the way in which i think lockdown is going to continue for some more time and in fact in sikkim we have already our uh, government has said that no tourists till uh, october so that is again uh, you know that's the kind of fear uh, that is there in the mountain states uh, because right now we like sikkim is free of covid so uh, that's the thing so th- i must thank uh, all the panelists uh, very very incisive i think uh, we we've come out with a rich set of uh, issues uh, that have been flagged i mean it's whether it is uh, like you know all states have to be ready for the next pandemic and i don't know how that uh, that is something where we have to take the help of scientists we have to look at uh, out migration people are going to stay back how is it that we are going to deal with the uh, huge amount of labor surplus that we are going to have and uh, what will it uh, what will be its uh, uh, you know ramifications uh, for the future in building uh, some of the uh, uh, in building the resilience i think a lot has been already said uh from organic farming to and en- ensuring that we have uh, uh you know mr vijay margins well done and the gdp which is uh, essentially green and digital prosperity he had mentioned this many many years ago i i recall it's over i think uh, 10 years ago that he had mentioned this to me and we had actually tried to do something about it but uh, we had failed so so also the transforming of the energy sector i think this is the uh, this is another key area that we have to think about the biggest i think uh, biggest uh, uh, thing that has come through is i think to be more local uh, than global i think this is with these words uh, i'd like to close this session and thank uh, more than 50 persons who have uh, placed questions there will be a group photo so i uh, believe everybody should uh, now put on their uh, uh, videos uh, then uh, uh, all relevant questions will be addressed uh, in the final documentation and email to every participant so i think uh, we have had a very uh, rich uh, set of uh, discussions and hopefully we'll be able to glean um uh, some of the ideas that may be taken forward in our next sustainable mountain summit uh, which will be coming up in 2020 hopefully in uttarakhand but uh, that said we keep our fingers crossed and uh, i hope everybody stays safe thank you and good evening